we're going to start by focusing on the classification problem and a particular class of algorithms called label propagation. The general idea behind the algorithm is, is this. So first we start by looking at samples that have uh, labels. We then identify their, the nearby samples that do not have labels yet. And then we copy those uh, labels out to those nearby samples. And then this process repeats and we continue to repeat until the entire set of samples has uh, either a true label or a pseudo label. A key question is, what do we really mean by uh, this idea of nearby? So there are some varieties of the algorithm where we just look at some k nearest neighbors, whether they're very nearby or, or far away. We could also make use of Euclidean distance to make a decision as to whether or not a sample is near enough. And whether, whether we take the k nearest neighbor or the Euclidean distance uh, approach, over repeated steps, what we really do is we, we end up walking along the local manifold around those true label samples. And at each step, we, we fill in these uh, pseudo labels. So the larger algorithm for building a classifier looks like this. We first take the step of propagating uh, the labels. So that then means that every sample has a, either a true label or a pseudo label. And then we use our favorite supervised learning classifier method to uh, actually build those classifiers. So let's look at a little bit more detail about this label propagation process. All right, let's work in a two-dimensional feature space. Again, since that's really easy to draw, so this is x0 by x1 here. And let's imagine having a set of uh, samples that are scattered in this space. So there's one set, and here's uh, another set. And right now, all of these samples are unlabeled. So we, we could go about learning, doing a little bit of manifold learning here, or a little bit of clustering with this uh, set of samples. But now let's imagine providing uh, a class label. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is, is uh, change this particular sample over to purple. and and I'm going to uh, set this particular class label over here to, uh, to green. So the essence of the label propagation algorithm is, as, as we've already talked about, is to look at that neighborhood, say around that purple sample, figure out who the neighbors are, the immediate neighbors, and then change their label over to, uh, to purple. And then we, repeat that step. So this sample over here might be near these two here, and so they get switched over, and then this sample might have these two neighbors, uh, etc. And this sample might uh, be a neighbor of those two, and then it's a neighbor of these guys over here. So now we've covered that entire local manifold area, that entire cluster. Likewise, uh, for green, we, we might uh, first in the first iteration, switch all of those over to a green label, and in the next iteration, uh, switch uh, the remainders over uh, to a green label. All right, so let's, let's talk through uh, one particular mathematical formulation for this. And this is a, a probabilistic type of an approach. And so what we're going to do is uh, define uh, P, I, K, and this is the probability uh, that sample i is in class k. And of course, because these are probabilities, then for every one of our i's, if we take a sum over all of the classes, then p i k, that sum is always equal to one. The initial step in the algorithm, where we initialize all of these PIKs, uh, looks like this. So for our labeled samples, PIK is one of two values. It's one if K is the true label.
and zero otherwise. And for unlabeled samples, we're just going to take a very conservative approach. We're going to set PIK to be equal to one over M, where M is uh, the number of classes that we have. So, so we're perfectly conservative in this particular choice. All right, after initialization, we're going to engage in a, uh, a loop essentially a search process here. And the first step uh, actually looks a lot like uh, the manifold learning processes that we've uh, talked about uh, recently. And the first step is to compute a score between sample i and sample j. And we're going to set that to be equal to e to the minus beta xi minus xj, distance between xi and xj. And exactly the, the details of this, whether we have a square here or not, don't matter so much for this level of uh, conversation. Um, but the key here is that uh, if we look at S i j as a function of this distance between the two vectors, when they are equal to one another, S i j is equal to one. Uh, because e to the zero is one. And then as xi and xj get further and further apart, this number begins to increase. Uh, so, so we're going to head off in this direction here. And our sij uh, actually uh, drops off uh, something along this, these lines here. It's, it's, like, it's sort of like one half of a Gaussian, but, but ex the exact shape is a little bit different since in this case, we don't have that square term in there. All right, the next step is to compute a, a normalized score, and I'm going to refer to that as Rij. And this is just uh, Sij. This is normalized by all of the neighbors of J. So L is going to iterate over all the, the neighbors of J, and uh, we're going to ask what Slj is here. So, so one way to think about this is I have a sample J sitting out here. Uh, we have our, uh, our I sample here, but J also has some other uh, neighbors in, in its vicinity. And, and we're going to ask what Sij is for each one of those. And, uh, and then Rij is just the normalized, uh, the, the normalized score for all of these links, such that the sum over all of those neighbors is equal to one. So this is normalized score. Okay, once we've computed normalized scores, then, then we can go about uh, propagating uh, the uh, labels from one sample to another. Now these, the, these labels are no longer discrete labels. They're probability distributions. Uh, and the, the way that we do this, there's, it's a two-step process. So I'm going to compute a p hat jk. And that is, we're going to look at all of the immediate neighbors for a, for a sample. And we're going to, uh, propagate uh, the probability of that other sample being in class K and how much we bring across to, uh, to here is proportional to that normalized score, or IJ. Okay, and, and we're going to do this for, uh, for every uh, J and for every class. So in, in some sense, what we're doing is we're computing a, uh, a weighted sum. So the, the probability distribution uh, for this uh, J here is just a weighted sum of uh, the probabilities uh, from all of those neighbors. And the weight is related to uh, this normalized score. In fact, the weight is the normalized score. So things that are very far away do, don't influence our probability distribution. Things that are nearby are the things that where Rij is 
uh, is it has an interesting value, and uh, those are the ones that get to propagate their their probability distribution. All right, and then the final step here is that we're going to update our probabilities, our p uh, jks, and this is just a normalized version of our p hat. And and this by by doing this normalization, then again we can uh, ensure that if we take the sum of probabilities for some sample j uh, over all of the classes, then that sum is one again. So we have a a proper probability distribution. So that's the entirety of the algorithm. So so this loop he, starts up here. We compute the sijs. We compute the rijs uh, and then the p hats, and then update our probabilities. And and then we repeat this loop. And, and this repetition continues until all of our probabilities have settled out. Uh, so after the loop, uh, we can either keep the probabilities as our labels, or we can uh, assign a crisp label based on the uh, highest uh, pj. So, so this just says find uh, over all of the, for a given j, find over all of the k's the, the one that maximizes this pjk, and we're going to assign that crisp uh, class label. We could go either way. That is the full label propagation uh, algorithm. Let's just do a little bit of uh, drawing here to kind of give us a sense of what's happening. So let's imagine we have our feature space, and we have a, a sample right here, uh, say a sample here, another one here, and let's imagine a, another sample way out over here. Actually, it's gonna be easier to draw if it is over here. Okay, we'll label these uh, samples 0, 1, 2, and 3. Let's blow that up. And what I'm going to do is assign a, a, a true label to, to uh, point uh, 0. And as such, what that means is that the probability for, uh, for 0, the probability distribution for 0 looks like this. I'm just going to write that as pi. Uh, that is 1, 0. Sorry, that's p0. Probability distribution for p1. Since it's an unlabeled sample, it gets 1 half, 1 half. So this is the initialization step. And likewise for p2 and p3. Now the distance from here to from zero to one and from one to two are about the same, so their scores are going to end up being the same. So because those distances are not zero but uh, but still fairly close to one another, their scores are not so uh, are, are not so bad. So uh, let's build an, a score matrix here. So I I to J. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, we're going to ignore, uh, well, the, si since uh, 0 is on top of 0, then its score is uh, equal to 1. So this is our Sij matrix. Zero, 0 to 1, the score is something smaller than 1. Uh, I'm just sort of eyeballing things here. Let's call that uh, 0.5. And one, 1 to 0 is also uh, 0.5. 1 to 1 is 1 is on top of each other, so it's 1. Uh, 1 to 2 
is a little bit closer than the distance from zero to one. So let's, I'm, again, I'm just making up these numbers. Let's say that that's 0 0.6. And zero to two, let's assume now that that score has really begun to drop off. So we'll call that 0 0.2. And then zero to three is very far away and it's sufficiently far away that we're gonna call that zero. And, and likewise, one to three. And then we can fill in from there. This is a, a symmetric uh, matrix. So 0.2, this is 0.6, and this is close to zero. And, uh, and then two to two is one, three to three is one, and then two to three, let's call that 0.1. All right, then the next step in our uh, algorithm is uh, to compute our Rijs. Again, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, oops, move that down. Now, if we look back up at the math here, let's find our Rij. Our, our sum over, uh, over all of our SI, so, a, so our SLs here, uh, is, going to be, uh, is going to be one. So what we want to do is, is uh, transform our SIJs to our uh, RIJs such that each of our columns uh, here sum to, uh, sum to one. And somehow I've left out our zero for J. So let's create space for that. Okay, so, so let's compute what the column sums are here. So this is uh, 1.7, uh, this is 2.1, this one is 1.9, and this one is 1.1. And, and three has a column sum that's smaller than the others because it's much further away from all of the other samples. So the, the algorithm is to then take this element here and divide it by uh, this uh, sum, and that value goes into the zero, zero uh, location, and this is, becomes uh, 0.59 approximately. And then we go on down from there. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill in this whole matrix. All right, I've filled in this Rij matrix, and the nice thing is that both Sij and Rij are going to be, remain constant uh, throughout this uh, loop. Okay, so let's look back at our algorithm here. So the next step is to compute this PIJ, uh, sorry, this PIJK uh, uh, value. So I'm gonna copy that so we have it for reference. And I'm, I'm only going to do a, a, a couple of, of these. But let's focus here on the case of J equals one. Um, so we're computing P, uh, J, and we can compute, we'll start with class zero here. And that's equal to uh, this sum here. So what we're going to do is walk down the, uh, the, the uh, set of samples and, and ask uh, what, their, what, what this product is. So uh, first off is a zero. So we wanna know what P zero uh, class uh, zero is, so P, Zero, zero is uh, one here. So this is equal to one, and we then need to know what the Rij is. So I is zero, J is one, so that's this 0.24 right here. And then, uh, and then I becomes one. So this is the I equals zero case, this is the I equals one case. So 
P uh, one zero is is uh, point five here, and we also need to know what the the corresponding R I J is, and that is uh, right here. So that's point four seven. And then the I equals two case, we're looking at this, so that's our 0.5. And uh, we need to know what I21 uh, is, so that is uh, right here. So that's 0.29. And the last case, um, we're using this uh, zero here, so there's a, a, a zero, so I equals uh, three is there. All right, so this is equal to 0.62. And now let's ask for the other class. So, so for i equals zero, we have that uh, zero there. So, uh, so that probability is zero, and so it doesn't really matter uh, that we have a 0.24. The next is uh, this one half right here, 0.5, and that's multiplied by our 0.47. And then uh, we have our next, sorry, our next 0.5 is right there, and that's multiplied by our 0.29. And then again, we have a, a zero. And together, the, these are equal to 0 0.38. Okay, so so we're doing this this weighted sum of the original uh, of the original p's, and the weights are uh, based on these r's. For j equals one, we have interesting r values for uh, zero, one, and two because they're all in this neighborhood here. But three is further away, so it does not contribute to our estimate of what the probability ought to be for sample one. For sample three, the the r's are here. We have zeros for sample zero and one because they're very far away. For two, we're a reasonable distance away, so there, but but we're still closer. So there's a little bit of weight there. So a bit of the probability from two will leak over to three, but for the most part, three gets to keep its own uh, probability distribution. And since two really has not uh, yet an interesting probability distribution. Uh, we're we're stuck at one half, one half in this first iteration. Um, there really there really is not going to be any change to our estimate of of three. Okay, so so now let's let's finally compute our our p j zero and our p j whoops not hat our p j zero and our p j uh, one where. Uh, j here is still is equal to 1. And that's just equal to 0.62 over 0.62 plus 0.38. And this one is uh, 0.38 over 0 0.62. 0.38 over 0.62 plus 0.38. Uh, conveniently, 0.62 plus 0.38 is equal to 1, so we're left at 0.62 and uh, 0.38. So the, the key here uh, now in this first iteration, what uh, J1 has done is it's gone from our original 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to this distribution here, 0 0.62, 0 0.38. And that is happening because sample 1 is uh, is rather near to uh, to sample zero, and over more more iterations, more of the probability from sample zero is going to leak its way over to one, and uh, we're also going to have some amount of of flow from from zero to two, and as one starts to shift over to uh, a a more polarized uh, distribution. Uh, it's also going to have an influences on two. And, and then over more and more iterations, eventually three will also uh, be uh, influenced in substantial ways. And in fact, if, if you were to 
execute this process, in the end, we would, we would end up with a probability distribution for every one of our samples at one zero. Now, if we had a scenario where there were nearby samples with the other class label, then those samples that sort of sit on that fringe between the, those that are near class one and those that are near class zero, then they're going to tend to remain at this uh, less defined uh, probability distribution of 0.5, 0.5, or somewhere around there. All right, so that's a little bit of intuition about how this uh, algorithm works. Uh, and uh, let me take one step back before we start talking about code. All right, so there are a variety of different variations to this label propagation type of an algorithm. If samples have a true label, then we can uh, make the choices to either always clamp them at their true probability distribution, or we can uh, allow those probabilities to float as well. Something that sits sort of in between those, those two ideas is, is that we can allow a certain number of true labels to, to change to a, uh, to a label that is different than their original label. And, and one way to express that is in terms of what percentage of true samples are allowed to, to make that flip. Label spreading is a particular variety of label propagation, and, and that's actually the scikit-learn example that we're going to do. Uh, in this case, we make use of an, an affinity graph uh, type of uh, structure to do the propagation of our labels. And what I mean by affinity graph here is actually this probability-based uh, representation of uh, what the class labels are and this very soft uh, propagation of, uh, uh, of probabilities from one sample to another. And, and what's nice about this type of an approach is that we, we tend to end up with uh, a smoother results than if we were to uh, force labels to be crisp at each stage of our algorithm. All right, so now it's time to look at a little bit of code.